Hi, it's Ken Dixon with Cleveland Live Music. This episode uh, of Ken Dixon's Deja Vu is part two of the A&E Review show from June 8th, 1990. And Lou Reed is interviewed about the Velvets, Andy Warhol, and his music. Get it right out of the mouth of the master, of the person who experienced it. You don't need to read all these books. He didn't write very many of them. Oh, any of them. So anyhow, listen to the dude. He knows his shit. It is said that the true measure of an artist cannot be taken while he's alive. It's the time that passes after his death that allows people to gain perspective. It has been a little more than three years since Andy Warhol died. Perhaps not enough time for a truly accurate perspective, but long enough to appreciate his continuing influence on art, as you already know, and on music, as you may be surprised to hear. Andy Warhol redefined the art world of the 60s by making the ordinary extraordinary, with his portraits of the humdrum soup can, and the extraordinary ordinary, with his multiple image silk screens of cultural icons like Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley. Warhol mass-produced his artworks at a silver-colored loft called The Factory, home base for the Warhol group of artists, actors, socialites, transvestites, and assorted hangers-on, as well as a band called The Velvet Underground. There she goes again. She's out on the streets again. Velvet Underground became the centerpiece of his traveling multimedia extravaganzas called The Exploding Plastic Inevitable. Typically, the band would play at excruciating volume while Warhol projected movies on them and various Warhol groupies danced on the stage. In 1967, Warhol produced the Velvet Underground's first album, featuring a Warhol-designed peelable banana on the cover. It was a sobering antidote to the flower power of the late 60s, with songs about heroin and death. Be the death of me. Velvet Underground. It was a musical group in the 60s of which it was said they didn't sell a lot of records, but almost everyone who bought one of their records started a group of his own. That's how influential Velvet Underground was. David Bowie, Talking Heads, R.E.M., all in later years came under that influence, which was to a large extent the influence of singer-songwriter Lou Reed. Lou and his Velvet Underground partner John Cale have recently released an album called Songs for Drella, which is a tribute to the late Andy Warhol. And Lou, we can go no further, I think, without my asking for an explanation of Drella. I've heard a lot of different uh, explanations of Drella. I've heard people say that Drella was a contraction of Cinderella and Dracula, that it was really uh, La Puella, a little bitch. And as far as I know, none of them are true. Do you know what is true? I haven't the vaguest idea who he's called that long before I got there. What's true is it was a nickname for Andy Warhol. It was a nickname and I still don't know what it means and he's not around to ask. For someone whose sound is as distinctive as yours is, how does it come to be that? Is it that when you are young, you listen to different music from others of your generation? Is it that you just have an entirely different sensibility? Where does one sound, especially a sound so different as yours, come from? When I was growing up, I was listening to rockabilly, uh, a lot of doo-wop, R&B, and uh, I'm not from the South, so I, I couldn't really uh, pretend to sing that way. I also um, only have a three-note vocal range, so I had to arrange things to encompass uh, what, for lack of another word, would be my style of doing things. It's, I didn't want to ape certain kinds of music. Which is to say that whatever came out was not a direct result of your saying, I want to take a little of this and a little of that. It was well, you know, when you listen to all these English bands, it's remarkable. They all have a black American, uh, Southern American <laughs> <laughs> accents. I always consider that a hilarious tribute to our music. Um, I myself didn't want to do that if I could possibly avoid it. And uh, 
I also really like the New York regional accents, which I have now. Have one. Was it ever a goal of yours to be different, or is it just that you were, and that's it? Thing, you know, I don't want to get Eastern on you, but things just seem to work out however they're supposed to work out. Um, Eastern in the sense of mystical and right. oriental. That is a Zen-like answer, yeah. I understand. But, uh, all through the Velvet Underground, I was very, very aware of, of that. And of course, John's influence coming from Wales. John Cale. Yeah. Put us, moved us even further from uh, the so-called mainstream um, approach to that type of music. But underneath it all, oddly enough, is the same three or four chords that uh, I've been in love with since I was around 11. Well, that was the, the doo-wop range, wasn't it? Three or four oh, yeah. chords. And rockabilly, and country. It was amazing. We got, and gospel, and blues. We got a whole decade out of three or four chords. That's very efficient. Well, actually, 50s. two. Two oh, decades yeah, or two it. chords? <laughs> I've gotten two decades out of their one <laughs> decade of chords, but their decade goes all the way back to really early blues things, you know, where if you listen to some of the early blues players, the way they're telling a story, uh, I always really like that. Tell me something about the influence Andy Warhol had on you. Was it, was it an influence on your music, on your, on your personal life? I just thought Andy was the most astonishing, great, uh, inspirational guy. And uh, I always, I really miss the fact that when I'm looking at something, I don't have Andy Warhol there with me, <coughs> excuse me, to let me hear his version of what we're looking at. <laughs> Meaning he, he helped you see differently? Oh, sure. I think, I think part of um, maturing and uh, life experiences is made up through uh, experiencing lots of things, meeting lots of people, and hopefully getting another point of view than your own. It's, uh, Andy would look at something and it wouldn't be what I saw. And I've always tried since then, among all the other things he taught me, to try to uh, look at something and really try to take at least a second and third to look at it, and not just go by the first thing that I saw. The song that you and John w will play for us shortly uh, from the album is called Nobody Like You, and uh, uh, lyrically it's just, I'll be your PR man on this one, it's, 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 uh, it's an intriguing, well-written Thank you. song. Um, t Tell us something about it. Well, I think it's best to listen to without uh, me intruding, telling you what it's about. But uh, what I could say about it, it was, it was an interesting thing to write, and it, there are things in there that I saw Andy do. Not all of them, may I say, flattering. Uh, the end of the song, which, uh, I mean, you should listen, those of you watching should listen to the entire song, but the end of the song is, is quite a surprise, and we should say it's, it's sung in the first person. You're singing it, but as if you were Andy, right? It is Andy's voice. Oh, yeah. I think the ending is somewhat poignant also. But not terribly flattering to the Andy Warhol character, which is to say that mm. in this album, you did, this is not a whitewash we to have, the extent. Have to be, no, it's not, but we have to be understanding of the person and the circumstances. Like I said, uh, in the context of the album, mm. it, uh, it makes more sense. Taking it out of context, perhaps it seems a little unflattering. Well, having cautioned everyone to listen carefully, now we have to ask you to wait before you listen carefully. We're going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back with Nobody Like You, performed by Lou Reed and his collaborator John Cale, after this. I feel intrusive walking in at this point. I hope my presence doesn't distract people from feeling the irony of the ending of that song. Thank you very much, Lou Reed. Lou, it was, it was uh, our pleasure to talk to you earlier, but that is not the case with you, John Cale. So let me direct a couple of questions to you. I assume, John, a man like Andy Warhol, there was so much that could be said about him. And even though you and, and Lou had 15 songs to say it in, what about the process of deciding what kinds of things you would say about him, what kinds of things you would omit? I think there had to be some allowance made for confusion of personas in the songs. And there was a bottom line that we agreed on before we even, even started working. But was that a bottom line that had to do with 
with the man's image? I mean, did you feel a certain responsibility to protect a part of him, to promote a part of him? Um, not to promote, but to protect, and, and also I think the, the, uh, the roles that we played in, in, in the 60s with him were, were sort of uh, non, uncritical, and we wanted to avoid the kind of uh, uh, biographies that were spewing forth at the time. Personally, w was it a process of, uh, of reviving memories that were especially poignant or painful or, or humorous? Very much so. I, but in the back of my mind, though, from the beginning of the project, what, what I was really interested in was uh, picking up where we left, left off in 1969, that is Lou and I, and really reviving the, 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 the musical partnership. And that was what I was really interested in. So what you're yeah. talking about two things here. You're talking about lyrically wanting to write a kind of biography and musically wanting to do something entirely distinct from that. Well, I, I, I think where the, where the music plays a role in the overall portrayal of, of, a, of a, a, an era, then it, it should reflect all the shifting personas that are in the songs. And before you can do that, you, you arrive at a bottom line as to what you don't want to do. And before that, you really, um, in my mind anyway, did it, it wasn't so much we want to write a piece about Andy. I, I don't think there was anybody other than Lou that could have handled that, that project. Um, in my mind, I really wanted to just uh, reform the, the partnership that we had in 1969. To, 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 there was a lot of unfinished business left in 1969, and I wanted to chase that and, and, and achieve it. Is it finished now? I don't think so. But it's progressed. It's progressed a great deal. Thank you, John. John Cale, Lou Reed. We'll be back after this.